across now to Sky's events commentator, Alistair Bruce, who's watching proceedings at Whitehall. Good morning, Alistair. Good morning. The music is often the same year on year as once more. We stop to remember the cost of freedom and the price that was paid in two world wars, but more recently in those military challenges that still face from time to time and being referred to there by the Chief of the Defence Staff in his discussion with Alistair Bunkle. The scene the same, the cenotaph at the centre of Whitehall, organised into its military perfection with the Royal British Legion's president there looking on, ready with senior members of the Royal British Legion to come forward and lay their poppies after. Her Majesty the Queen's wreath has been laid, other members of the royal family, the government, representatives of different political persuasions and many of the Commonwealth countries. In 1920, King George V came to unveil the cenotaph and it has been the focus of the nation's remembrance every year where veterans come to reflect on their friends who they didn't bring back from battle or to just be together again. And that is always an important part of what being in the armed forces has always meant the Army Air Corps, light blue berries in the background there. And other symbols are worn today, particularly medals. Each one tells a story of where someone served or how long they served. And it's always good when they bring children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren to watch the ceremony. As we look down upon the seen there, the balcony is where Her Majesty the Queen will appear with the Duke of Edinburgh later as the mass bands of the Household Division, the bands of Her Majesty's Royal Marines Portsmouth and the central band of the Royal Air Force play to accompany our thoughts. Since we last gathered here at the Cenotaph for Remembrance, one member of the United Kingdom's armed forces has died in the conduct of duty. His name was Lance Corporal Scott Hetherington, who died during Operational Shader in Iraq as a result of an accident. We think of his family and friends, particularly today. traditional setting and part of the program of music that has remained pretty continuous since 1930. Music that originally evoked the painful memories of the First World War to a generation assuming that the world would never go to war again and within six years. The Second World War, the greatest struggle perhaps for Europe of all time presented itself and many who thought 
they would never have to go to war again, were back on battlefields in France, digging trenches precisely over the graves of their friends. The pipes and drums of the Highlanders, 4th Battalion, the Royal Regiment of Scotland. Every year, Queen's Scouts come to hand out orders of service and after they've completed their task, they take position as an honour guard. And of course, it will be from her position just above the parade today that the Queen will see her Scouts playing their part in this annual ceremony. There we see the cenotaph itself with the symbolic empty tomb at its head, designed so that all thoughts from any family, anywhere in the world, could be placed uniquely in that place. And on its side, the evocative words, the glorious dead, to remind that in that glory is the freedom that we have earned. Everyone has memories that they think about during the two minute silence in the playing of Elgar's Nimrod. Perhaps think of all the many armed service personnel who face danger today, who are ready for duty and think of those people who you know or stories you've heard and remember.
Music is being led today by Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Roberts of the Welsh Guards, the Director of Music. Shortly, the scene around the cenotaph will take its formal order with the arrival of the processions. But it's this procession, that of the veterans and the organizations that stretches all the way up towards Trafalgar Square. They came here earlier today. They're gathered around the Women at War Memorial, which sits also in the middle of Whitehall. Amongst them, serving people from the armed forces today are ready to help guide the procession. That will fill Whitehall with music and memories later on. On the memorial for the women at war are the clothes that were worn in the various professions that women stepped into at a very different social time, but it marked a considerable step. The music, When I Am Laid in Earth from Purcell, again reflecting upon the cost of war. the procession of the Chapels Royal, the children of the Chapels Royal, led by one of their former choristers who is carrying the cross with its poppies today. Children of the Chapels Royal were expected in the medieval period to travel with kings in battle and were present in order to provide King Henry V with religious prayer and contemplation during the campaign that included the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And at the back of that procession, the Right Reverend, the Lord Charters, who was raised to the peerage recently on stepping down from being Bishop of London. He's the Dean of the Chapels Royal, an appointment that goes back to 1312, two years before the Battle of Bannockburn. And following the ecclesiastical procession, will come that of the political leaders and also the representatives of the Commonwealth. And perhaps in the number of them, a recognition of how vast was the involvement of people around the world in war as the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition come into their place, holding the wreaths that later on they will lay at the steps of this iconic memorial. And behind the current serving leaders of the parties come former Prime Ministers. Sir John Major we saw there just taking his place. He'll be joined by Tony Blair, Gordon Bryan and David Cameron as the military commanders led by the Chief of the Defence Staff who was speaking to Ali Bunkle earlier today take their positions and all the Commonwealth representatives, most of them are High Commissioners, and of course following a new tradition of a few years ago, the Ambassador 
from Ireland will also lay a wreath, remembering the enormous loss of life in the First World War caused to Ireland's families. Representatives of religious bodies will now also take their place as we finally wait for the arrival of the royal family. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh will appear on the balcony looking down on this ceremony. And on Her Majesty's behalf, the Prince of Wales will take the position Her Majesty traditionally did and will lay her wreath for Her Majesty after the two minute silence. to the supreme sacrifice and solemn melody now by Wolford Davis. As the Major General commanding the Household Division, Major General Ben Bathurst, his Chief of Staff and ADC take their position, which is the symbol that any minute now the Royal Family will take their place. It is, after all, the gathering of all those who lead the United Kingdom both past and present, and with the presence of Her Majesty the Queen. It is the national focus and the national act of remembrance. Very brought to attention. And you can see the balcony where Her Majesty the Queen will appear shortly in the middle above the principal door. As His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales leads other members of his family to the north side of the Cenotaph. And Her Majesty the Queen will appear at the balcony to watch as her son makes her gesture of remembrance. You're watching Sky News as Her Majesty the Queen takes her position to lead the nation in this year's Act of Remembrance at Whitehall.
with the last post sounded by the Royal Marines. The Queen's wreath is handed to the Prince of Wales and on Her Majesty's behalf, the Sovereign's Act of Remembrance is made. And the Queen will bow. Captain Ben Tracy will now lay the Duke of Edinburgh's wreath. The Duke of Edinburgh, of course, was present in the Pacific after fighting for much of the Second World War when the peace treaty was signed, bringing to an end the war in the East. The Prince of Wales will now lay his own wreath with the distinguishing badge of the heir apparent, the three feathers. The Prince of Wales served with all three of the armed services, commanded a ship in the Royal Navy, wearing today the uniform of Marshal of the Royal Air Force. And three Aquarius bring forward now to the Duke of Cambridge, Prince Henry of Wales, and the Duke of York, their reeds. The Duke of Cambridge and Prince Harry representing a generation that served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the Duke of York served in the Falklands War. And for the Queen, so many memories of the Second World War, she represents a generation that saw and knew all the trials and hardships of that time. As the Earl of Wessex, the Princess Royal, and the Duke of Kent lay their wreaths. The Duke of Kent's father was killed during the Second World War. And the parade will be stood at ease. Right. At ease. And as the band Easy. starts the well-known music, the Funeral March Number no. 1 in B flat minor by Beethoven, the wreath on behalf of Her Majesty's Government will be laid by the Prime Minister. The burden for making decisions about the committing of Britain's military forces remains, although subject to the House of Commons. The key responsibility of the Prime Minister as the executive head of government. And she has behind her today Prime Ministers who have made that decision. And following those decisions, so many have lost their lives. The leader of the Labour Party and of the opposition, the Right Honourable Jeremy Corbyn. This year, on behalf of the SNP and Plaid Cymru Parliamentary Group, Mr Ian Blackford who is the Westminster Scottish Nationalist Party leader. The recently chosen leader of the Liberal Democrats, the Right Honourable Vince Cable. In 1920, when this ceremony first began, it was part of the event to 
lay to rest in funeral service in Westminster Abbey, the unknown warrior. And Lloyd George was present to lay his wreath as Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Nigel Dodds, he's the leader in Westminster of the Democratic Unionist Party. And on behalf of the House of Commons, the Right Honourable John Burko. As Speaker, he represents the proper running of the processes of the House of Commons and ensures that all representatives have the chance to do their duty to protect all their constituencies throughout the United Kingdom. And performing a similar role in the House of Lords, the Lord Speaker, the Right Honourable, the Lord Fowler. And hitherto, the poppy has prevailed and is the symbol of remembrance. But the next wreath laid by the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the Right Honourable Boris Johnson, is made up of flowers that come from different parts of those dependent territories that look to the United Kingdom for their defence and who in their own way have made contributions to the two world wars and other battles beyond. The Commonwealth now and as members of the royal family, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester and Admiral Tim Lawrence look on. The first group to lay theirs will be Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and India. The Duchess of Cambridge too with Princess Alexandra. The tour of the world's nations continues with the second group. High Commissioners for Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ghana, Malaysia, Nigeria, Cyprus, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, and Uganda. British ceremony is properly rehearsed and the High Commissioners are required to go to a military barracks and there the Garrison Sergeant Major gives them clarity on precisely how to act together as a team and make sure that this dignified ceremony looks perfect in every way in respect to those who gave their lives. These eight Representatives of Kenya, Malawi, Malta GC received the George Cross from King George VI for the resolute and determined courage of the islanders during the Second World War. Zambia, Singapore, which fell early in the Second World War and faced tremendous hardship with most of the British troops working on the railway line to Burma many losing their lives. Also Guyana, Botswana and Lesotho. In the fourth group, Barbados, Mauritius, Swaziland, Tonga, Fiji, Bangladesh, the Bahamas, Grenada, Papua New Guinea and the Seychelles. Bonded together here in a family of nations, watched by the head of the Commonwealth, Her Majesty the Queen, who has dedicated her reign to the protection and promotion of the Commonwealth as the means by which people can hold the friendships of the past and keep the peace of the future. The final group of the High Commissioners represent the Commonwealth of Dominica, St Lucia, 
St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Belize, Antigua and Barbuda, many of these countries that have faced their own challenges this year, St. Christopher and Nevis, Brunei, Dar es Salaam, Namibia, Cameroon, Mozambique and Rwanda. And acknowledging the enormous debt that is owed by the United Kingdom to the people of Ireland, particularly for their sacrifice during the First World War, the Ambassador of Ireland will lay his wreath. And now watched by the Chief of the Defence Staff, the three service chiefs will lay wreaths for the Royal Navy, the Army and the Royal Air Force. Admiral Sir Philip Jones for the Royal Navy, who is the First Sea Lord, the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Nicholas Carter, and the Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Stephen Hillier. And then for the Civil Services, Captain Martin Reed for the Merchant Navy and Fishing Fleets. I'm on a board with him looking after the Falklands Memorial Chapel to reflect upon the Falklands War that he took part in and so did I. Also Mr Adrian Led from the Air Transport Auxiliary Association and for the Civilian Services, the National Police Chiefs Council Chair, Miss Sarah Thornton. And the service will proceed led by the Dean of the Chapels Royal. O Almighty God, grant we beseech thee that we who here do honour to the memory of those who have died in the service of their country and of the Crown may be so inspired by the spirit of their love and fortitude that forgetting all selfish and unworthy motives, we may live only to thy glory and to the service of mankind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the hymn, O God our help in ages past, Teach us, good Lord, 
to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, To God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and always. Amen. The rise will be played by the trumpeters of the Royal Air Force and then the national anthem. Her Majesty the Queen will bow to the cenotaph and leave as members of the royal family take their leave from their positions on the north side of the cenotaph and the National Act of Remembrance, led by the Sovereign, accompanied by members of the royal family, has been delivered and the Earl of Wessex will go on to represent the Queen at the march past in Horse Guards Parade later on. He will be accompanied by the new Secretary of State for Defence and the National President of the Royal British Legion. The Prime Minister will leave the parade ground too, leading other political leaders and the former Prime Ministers who are present. The Dean of the Chapel Royal, Lord Charters, who is introduced to the House of Lords with a title. He'll actually be introduced himself soon into the chamber, led by the Sergeant of the Vestry there, followed by the Sub-Dean. And then behind in the Scarlet Cassock is Major General, the Reverend David Coulter who is the Chaplain General of the Armed Services in the Land Army. 
so part of the army, and he's part of the Church of Scotland. And the processions will return into the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the similar order to that which brought them out, led by the head of government and leader of the opposition. And it is on Parliament that decisions about the force of arms are made, the armed forces, as the Chief of the Defence Staff said in his interview today, are led by civilians. That's the nature of the British Constitution. It is Parliament that will decide what the United Kingdom's armed forces will do. And their duty is to do it. The High Commissioners will now return to their commissions with the single ambassador here coming from Ireland. And as they move off, you'll notice the distinctly different manner of departure by the service chiefs who will salute over five steps to the cenotaph, which is the traditional way, as they take leave of this memorial to the fallen. As they march in step. And then the religious representatives who have come from many faiths today, who represent the spectrum of belief in the United Kingdom, Islamic, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, United Hebrew Congregations, the Baptist Union, United Reformed Church, Methodist Conference, international churches, free churches, and the Rome Catholic Church. And marking the conclusion of the formal element of the parade, the Major General commanding the Household Division, Major General Ben Pathurst, whose father is still serving as an Admiral of the Fleet in the Royal Navy. And he is followed by his Chief of Staff, and his ADC from the Welsh Guards, which is the regiment from which General Ben served. The parade will stand at ease. And stand easy. And uh, for them, the chance to stop and think as the lifeguards, who are, of course, ceremonial troops today, but at any time can be called upon to get ready and go out and deliver violence against the Queen's enemies. The wreath-laying party for the Royal British Legion who have traditionally done so much to mark those who have lost their lives in conflicts and making sure that those through that memory who have survived and who face difficulty through injury or some need or other are properly looked after. And it is your poppy if you felt like purchasing one this year in any part of the United Kingdom that goes forward to that work. And Air Marshal David Walker, who lays his wreath, is the national president of the Royal British Legion and therefore, on behalf of all, lays a wreath that echoes another statue on Whitehall, that of Earl Haig, the general on the Western Front in the First World War, who started the Haig Fund, the poppy appeal that we know so well. And then in their group, the other representatives of the Royal British Legion, a very evident saltire there of the Royal British Legion Scotland. And 
They will now set off and leading them. On behalf of Transport for London, Wreath Layer Gary Best, followed by the Royal Air Force Association, Wreath Layer is Dr. Brian Patterson. The Royal Naval Association, Wreath Layer Miss Carol Gibbon. The Royal Commonwealth Ex Services League, General David Richards, who used to be the Chief of the Defence Staff. And he's now Lord Richards in the House of Lords. And laying that wreath for the Royal British Legion Scotland, Mr. Charlie Brown. And for the Royal British Legion Women's Section, Mrs. Patricia Crimes. And now with the formal ceremony over, Whitehall will be handed over to the veterans who are waiting in the distance beyond this great cenotaph with its very simple empty tomb at the top. There they are, children brought along today and they've mustered from all over the United Kingdom. Some of them have come further afield too and it's an annual pilgrimage for many and they absolutely love it. And for those families who managed to come very early today to find space along the side to support these veterans, there's someone from the Burma Star Association, that means he served in the difficult area around the Pacific fighting against the Japanese in what was some of the most horrific fighting and it was said by General Slim that they were the forgotten army and Lord Mountbatten when he went out to rally them as the Supreme Allied Commander said, you're not just the forgotten army. Nobody's even heard of you, but I'm going to change all that. And they won with the most vicious of battles and no least, not least the arrival of the most horrific weapons of warfare, the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. The Second World War finally ended. But with the leadership of the Royal British Legion there now waiting, many of them wearing the traditional bowler hat, which is very rarely seen now, and all the columns behind ready to march past, it is a chance for those memories to be relived. But as I say, the organisers are the Royal British Legion who have benefited so much during the poppy appeal this year and the money that they have raised will be used to support so many veterans and people who have left the armed forces for whatever reason, either with some difficulties or finding life more challenging. But the poppy, as they say, is a powerful symbol of remembrance because it grew in the chaotic disorder of land that had been heavily shelled on the Western Front. The bands are repositioning now so that they can individually lead the different columns. This cross of white chrysanthemums is probably the most moving of all the different tributes that are laid. It is laid by the War Widows Association, in memory of the husbands who didn't come home. World War I melodies and songs of the Great War, arranged by Barnwell, follow there the march of the Royal British Legion by Bidgood. Music that may have remained unaltered, but seems still to evoke very well the idea of many different generations reflecting upon the past.
Well, I'm about 50 yards from the cenotaph with some of the many thousands of... And now we move on to the next stage, which will be when all those memories from Scotland rise back into our thoughts and... It's almost been rather like a frosty morning in Scotland here in London. The sun has been out earlier on. Certainly makes it easier for those who've come a long way and particularly those who are of an older age. And I think that this year will be remembered with the Queen's decision to have her wreath laid for her, that she representing that Second World War generation. They are now at a stage where they don't particularly wish to take on any unnecessary physical challenges and find it much, much easier to be present, but not to lay wreaths. And it is that process which the Royal British Legion is also very keenly aware about because many of those who served were very fit after the Second World War, but who have lived good and long lives now need a certain amount of help to get them through this or that. And that work has been so useful. And the Royal British Legion, which was founded in 1921 and took responsibility for this next stage of the parade, which is the march past of the veterans in 1927. Let's listen to the pipes. Every year there are anniversaries to look back upon and the United Kingdom always tries to mark them in a respectful and appropriate manner. And this year is quite similar because only on the 6th of November in 1917 did the long and hideous battle of Passchendaele come to an end. I went out to Passchendaele earlier this year to mark the involvement of Scottish regiments there. And it is very plain to anyone with a military training, looking at the run of the rivers and the nature of the ground, how quickly with shelling the rivers moved into the mud and became really an extension of a swamp. Not a hot one, but just boggy ground everywhere. And anyone who goes to Ypres, to see the Menin Gate, which is the memorial to the thousands who were killed and have no known grave, will know how well remembered every year there the events are. And so many cadets, young children at school, go out and see Tynecott Cemetery and other cemeteries. And the Commonwealth War Graves Commission is responsible for maintaining those and was set up also a hundred years ago this year. And this year has launched the Commonwealth War Graves Foundation, which gives anybody who wants to the chance to join in, become a member, and will actually be called a pal, and the chance to work with and support the education into future generations of what the huge sacrifice of war meant, and why we must respect it and protect the memory because it reminds us that therein is the freedom we cherish. Other things being remembered this year, the Seven Squadron is celebrating 
its 103rd anniversary this year, the Association of Wrens, the women of the Royal Naval Services, celebrating its centenary this year. As the first column marches off. And led by those who we saw laying wreaths earlier on. And those who we've seen earlier on with their wreaths all ready to lay them at the cenotaph. People with memories that they treasure in different ways, either with reflective sadness about people who are not with us today, but we'll say the closeness that military service in combat provides. This is the Royal British Legion March and leads the start. And you'll see the wreath grabbers as they take all the wreaths as they come past. And we start to see the importance of medals to servicemen and women. You look out particularly for those medals that people have placed on the right-hand side of their jackets. These are medals of people who were in their family, their mothers, fathers, grandparents,